126 in your hymns, Modern Nation. Again, we'll sing all four verses of We Will Glorify.
41 in your hymnals. Sing all four verses of Take Time to Be Holy. Go ahead and stand. And as we sing the first verse, the children are dismissed to Children's Church. child of the king, a child of the king. Jesus, my savior, I'm a child of the king. So thank you very much. That's a, a great, a great reminder. Well, this morning, we uh, will be completing our study in the book of Ephesians. And I'm sure we'll have opportunity to visit again from time to time in this important strategic book in the scriptures, but uh, enjoyed looking through this portion of God's word and, and pray that it has helped us to have a stronger doctrinal foundation as believers, as a church. And I pray that we've been able to take to heart the many moral, practical, ethical uh, challenges that are issued for us to live out our faith in a way that blesses God's people and honors our Lord. So let's look to the word, to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. I pray that we would realize that it is that engrafted word which is able to strengthen our souls. Lord, that is not just an idle pastime of something churches are supposed to do as an empty, lifeless tradition. But, Father, it is the very lifeblood of the church that the Spirit takes the Word and powerfully works in our hearts to stir our conscience, to shape our mind, to steal our will, to help us to be tender and committed to the work of God in our lives. And, Father, I pray that this morning that you would Take even this simple ending passage of Scripture and use it to profoundly encourage our hearts. And Lord, we do thank you that you care about your people, that you want to strengthen us, you want to shape us, you want to use us, and you want us to be encouraged for all the right reasons. 
and we'll give you the praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you enjoy saying goodbye to people? Not a real popular pastime. Some goodbyes are a lot harder than others. I can remember the look in my parents' eye when they said goodbye when I went off to college. That was a lot different than the look that they said goodbye when I went off on a camping trip with Christian Service Brigade and I'd be back the next day. Some goodbyes are harder because we know it might potentially be our last time to see someone special. How do you say goodbye? Do you prefer short goodbyes? Quick, get it done. Or long goodbyes, lingering and taking in every last ounce of opportunity to convey a passion and love. Are you emotional when you say goodbye? Or do you prefer the, let's just keep this calm, folks. You know I love you. I know you love me. Goodbye kind of stoic and stayed. There are some folks who prefer that approach. Do you prefer a warm, lingering embrace or a hand wave, a handshake? Some people actually won't even say goodbye. They use other phrases that seem less painful or less permanent for them, like, see you soon, or until we meet again. Others will simply sneak away in the pre-dawn hours so they can avoid the pain of having to say goodbye at all. Whatever your temperament, whatever your cultural background, goodbyes are an important part of life. We want to make sure that when we do say goodbye to someone, that we want to leave in a way that strengthens them, that encourages them. We want to say goodbye in wise and unselfish ways. We want the pleasantness of our visit to linger. We want the impact of our words to speak, providing continuing benefit long after our car is out of their sight. How do you say goodbye? Well, this morning, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that honestly is too often overlooked. It's actually a goodbye shared from a distance by the Apostle Paul with a group of people that he loved dearly, that he had great spiritual investment in, that he had great spiritual concern for. And as he writes to these people, he wants to convey something to them that would steal their heart, not S-T-E-A-L, like steal it away, but to steal it, to, to strengthen, to firm up their resolve. He, he wants to, to help them have heart. He wants them to, to be bold in going forth for the Lord, and he, he wants to seize this opportunity to share some things with them that he thinks will be a, a spiritual benefit and a blessing to them. Paul did not know if these written words would be his final greeting to the Ephesians. He wanted to accomplish something of significant value for them. He wanted to communicate his message in a way that would strengthen and encourage his dear friends. And so Paul finished reminding these believers how to stand strong and be well equipped for the trials and the temptations of life, how to fight the spiritual battles as the Lord had equipped them. And as he finished this letter to the church, he includes some final words of encouragement. And we'll read those in just a moment. But I, I was reminded of, uh, of a preacher and a, a writer who God has used in my personal life in many ways. I actually even had opportunity when I was in seminary in Chattanooga to visit with this faithful gentleman. He, he's truly been used to the Lord in a great way. His name is Warren Wearsby. Um, used to pastor in, in Covington, Kentucky. He pastored in Chicago, Illinois. He was head of the Back to the Bible ministry out in Nebraska. Had done a number of different things over the years. But he said this, we are not fighting the battle alone as believers. There are other Christians who stand with us in the fight. 
And we ought to be careful to encourage one another. And I think that was Paul's spirit here in Ephesians chapter 6. And I'd like you to look at this, these verses with me. Look at uh, four verses, three main ideas, I think, that are, are woven into these verses. And we can take those truths away that hopefully will be a source of encouragement to us as we continue to serve the Lord and fight the battle. But that you also may know my affairs and how I do, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that you might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. The first thing we can see in verse 21 and 22 is that God uses faithful servants to encourage other believers. God uses faithful servants to encourage other believers. You can see that in verse 21 and 22. Now, he, Paul mentions in this passage a, a specific person's name, Tychicus. And uh, he is described as a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord. And we'll come back to that. But Paul begins by starting out, explaining why it was so important for him to write to these Ephesians and add this footnote. He, he knew that they were facing trials and challenges. They had faced challenges since the day Paul started the church there. I mean, there had been riots of battling against the preaching of the gospel because they saw it as a financial and a cultural threat to their idol worship production. And Paul had a deep love for those believers and wanted to make sure they were encouraged. Paul had a deep love for those believers and wanted to make sure they were encouraged. Paul was a loving minister friend to these folks. His heart went out to them even though he was the one who was confined. I mean, remember where Paul is writing from? He is incarcerated in the Roman Empire's capital in the city of Rome. He's taken a, uh, several years as he worked through the legal system, and he has now made it all the way to Rome. And he is there, and he's writing to these believers, and he wants to make sure that even though he's the one who's incarcerated, he's constantly thinking about the well-being of others. And, and folks, that really is a mark of maturity in believers, that we do not become consumed by our own struggles and trials. We do not become consumed and caught up with our own self-interests, but that we lovingly and unselfishly are thinking of, I wonder how he's doing. I wonder how she's getting along. I, how, I wonder how they are all encouraged. And, and, and Paul must have received word that the believers there were, were burdened for him. This was their beloved apostle. This is the man God used to help plant the church there. And, and, and they were burdened for him. So as a loving, unselfish minister friend, his heart went out to them. And because he was a wise minister, he knew how dangerous discouragement could be. I mean, he previously had mentioned to the Ephesians this matter of discouragement. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 13. He had written to them in the same letter, Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. I mean, God is using all these things for your benefit. But I don't want you to be overwhelmed, to faint, to get discouraged, and to give up because of my troubles that I'm going through. I want you to be steadfast. I, I served the Lord and invested my life in you, and I don't want to see you get discouraged. I, I want to remind you, don't give up. Don't faint. God used news of a faithful servant's condition to encourage these dear believing friends. Paul didn't want them to be discouraged. He wanted them to know that even though he was under house arrest, he was having many opportunities to serve the Lord. In, in essence, in our modern religious expression, we might say, hey, even though things look bad from where you're looking, God is good. Don't be discouraged. Don't give up 
don't give up in your, your constancy and your faithfulness for the Lord. And he wanted to encourage them to stay folks, to don't faint. He was, for example, he sent word um, with Tychicus, and they realized that Paul was having many opportunities to write scripture. I mean, it is very likely that Tychicus delivered not only the letter of Ephesians to these folks, but he carried a few miles further inland the book of Colossians. During the same period of time, Paul was also able to write the book of Philippians. And we know what's the theme of the book of Philippians. Over and over and over again, it talks about joy in the Lord, even in the midst of difficult trials and circumstances. So Paul sent Tychicus, he wanted him to know, he wanted these fellow believers to know, just because things look bad doesn't mean God isn't doing something good. He reminded them also that he was having many opportunities to witness for Christ. Now, look back at the book of Philippians. We, we looked at this a, a few weeks back before we started the study of Ecclesiastes in adult Sunday school. We looked at the power of joyful living in the book of Philippians. And, and I want to just look at a couple of verses here in Philippians chapter 1. Verse 12 through 14 Paul sent word so that they would know that even though he was confined, that the word of God was not confined, that his ministry was not confined, God was opening up great doors of opportunity. Philippians 1 verse 12, But I would that you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. I mean, it looks like my life is going backwards, but the gospel's going forwards. That's not such a bad deal, is it? Or is our life so revolved around our comfort and convenience and pleasures that anything that makes it feel like I'm going backwards in my agenda just ruins my life? The fact is, things were going backwards for Paul, but they were going forward for the gospel, and he rejoiced in that. He says, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. I mean, all over the place, the reason Paul was incarcerated was obvious to people. People were hearing, here's a guy who hasn't committed any crimes. Here's a guy who's in prison because he loves God. Here's a guy who's in prison because he wants to tell people about the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. I tried to be fearless in proclaiming the word, Paul says, and because of that, God is using that to stir the hearts of others to be fearless in the proclamation of the word. Not just missionaries, not just church planters, not just apostles. Believers were, were spreading the word all throughout the empire. And if God can give Paul the grace to go forward in times of hardship and difficulty, if God can help Paul to be fearless in the face of the might of the Roman Empire, then God can help me to be fearless in sharing the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul added in that Philippian letter at the very end, chapter 4, verse 22, all the saints salute you. I mean, all those saints that were there in the, the area of Rome, they all send their greetings to you in Philippi. Chiefly or especially those that are of Caesar's household. Folks, even though Paul was confined to a small house that he had to pay for himself and was chained to guards all the time, the gospel was spreading into the very palace of Caesar and his soldiers and his servants, even members of Caesar's extended family, were coming to believe in Jesus Christ as Savior. And Paul said, I want you to know what God is doing. Just because I'm confined, just because I'm going through difficult circumstances, I don't want you to think that it's for naught. God is doing great things, and I want you to be encouraged. Look at Acts chapter 28. Because there's another little picture given of how God was using Paul, even in this difficult time. In Acts chapter 28, I'm going to read some select verses, beginning in verse 17. 
And this, this shows Paul's interaction with Jewish leaders in Rome. Remember, the Jewish leaders in Palestine had, had persecuted and had tried to kill him, and he had to appeal to the Roman officials to, to preserve his life. And, and they couldn't find anything that he had done wrong, but because he had appealed to Caesar, they said, then to Caesar you must go. And he went all the way through the system, being transferred one step at a time. And eventually he ends up in Rome, and he, he meets with Jewish leaders, calls for them to come, and they meet with him. Verse 17 says, And it came to pass that after three days Paul called the chief of the Jews together. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. And who is the hope of Israel? The Messiah, Jesus the Christ. He is the one that Israel had waited for. He is the one that Israel had looked for. And Paul speaks of him, and it's for this reason that I am bound in these chains. Verse 23, and when he had appointed him a day, that is when he'd set an appointment with them, there came many to him into his lodging to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And Paul, verse 30, Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came into unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And folks, I, I think it is really important that when we're going through hard times, that we seek as an act of faith and obedience, that we seek as an act of worship for the Lord, that we seek opportunity to have a proper focus and to share that proper focus with others. Because you know, you talk down, you talk discouraged, you talk hopeless, you talk like, oh my, I mean, you get the Eeyore complex, right? You, you all know how that happens. And you know what happens when too many people start talking like Eeyore? Everybody thinks they're Eeyore. And you know what Paul said? None of that. I'm in, incarcerated, but look what God is doing. You couldn't have planned this many unique opportunities. Influencing all the way to Caesar's household, to the Praetorian Guard, influencing the chief leaders of the Jewish people in Rome. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And folks, I, I think we need to really pray that God would help us to keep our perspective and, and perseveringly share things that would help people maintain a proper perspective and be encouraged that what God is doing even in difficult times, right? Right? That's important. I didn't say it was easy. I did say it was important. And you know what? How did Paul do that? By the grace of God? Because of the love of God? And God was doing great things, and it was an encouragement. It did put steel into their spine. It did put power into their heart. It emboldened them to keep going. Instead of dragging along, it picked up their spirits. And that was Paul's desire. He wanted them to keep focused and to move forward. And, and along with that, Paul, Paul could only include just so much in this letter. I mean, he included all that God wanted him to include in this letter, and he included it as God had him write it. But there were a lot of things that weren't in the letter that Paul wanted to share with those Ephesians. And, and so what he did was he said, I'm going to pick the most trustworthy servant I know because I can't go to be with them. I can't hug them goodbye. I can't high five them goodbye. I can't even fist bump them goodbye. So I'll write to them and I'll send my most faithful, loyal, trusted, wise fellow laborer that I know who's available. And his name was Tychicus. God used a beloved and faithful friend to share that encouraging news. 
I mean, some messages, some ministry assignments are so important that they need to be assigned to the most dependable, faithful, humble people you know in ministry. And so Paul said, Tychicus, look, you've been, you've been waiting on me. You, you've been helping me through this, this long imprisonment. I can't leave the house. I'm chained to these soldiers. So you go and you come. You send messages out. You bring messages back. You go get food. You bring food back. You, you pray with me. We read scripture together. What an encouragement you've been. But I, I have got to encourage these people. So I'm sending you. I would rather be alone and know that the message gets to them and you can convey not just the words on the paper, but convey my heart, convey, convey my burden. And Tychicus did exactly that. Tychicus here is called a beloved brother. I mean, he was a brother that everybody who knew him loved him. He was a faithful minister in the Lord. That is, he kept on doing what was good and right even when it was hard. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 7, he is also called a fellow servant. Or if you knew the Greek language, it would sound more to you like a fellow slave. And I'm sending this beloved brother, this faithful minister, this fellow slave of Jesus, so that he can share with you this news that will be an encouragement about how God is working through all of these difficult times so that you will be encouraged and continue to serve the Lord steadfastly. So, you know, without going into a lot of history and a lot of information about him, as there's actually a fair number of things spoken about Tychicus in the New Testament, I think it would be sufficient to say that Paul trusted him so much that he assigned him some of the most challenging missions he had. He was ready to provide relief for Titus in Crete when Titus needed a break, needed to move on. He later sent him to help in Ephesus. He traveled with Paul to deliver a special offering to the church in Jerusalem. And God still uses faithful, trustworthy, reliable, humble servants of the Lord to be a blessing to others. So I guess that, that kind of comes back to a practical question of application for all of us. How trustworthy and faithful and reliable and humble are we? What kind of assignments, what kind of messages can God entrust to us that we'll share the facts, and we'll share the heartbeat of what God is doing in the ministry. In what ways does God find us faithful so that he can entrust to us significant assignments, so that God can entrust to us ministry that will produce, by his spirit, profoundly encouraging results in the ministry of other people? And God still uses people who are willing for God to make them faithful, trustworthy, reliable, humble servants of the Lord. And those kind of people will always be a blessing to all. And if we allow the Lord to develop us into those faithful, trustworthy, reliable, humble servants of the Lord, there will always be innumerable ways for us to be a blessing to others for the cause of Christ. Well, let me point us to a couple other things in much more brief fashion. Just two verses and two quick ideas. God uses reminders of divine blessings to encourage other believers. Paul didn't want people merely to know what God was doing in his life. He wanted them to know what God was trying to do in their lives. And he, he shares with them some of the divine blessings that we have in the Lord, and he, he wants that to be a source of encouragement. I mean, you know, some, we, we want to be able to change circumstances for people, wouldn't we? I mean, we, would, we wouldn't want people to be sick. We wouldn't want people to be unemployed. We wouldn't want people to, to be harassed or hounded or persecuted. We wouldn't want people to, to go through conflict. But sometimes, when you can't avoid those things, 
It's not the last resort. It should be our first response. But it is the thing. When, when, when circumstances don't change, it is the reality and the reminder of those spiritual blessings that fuels our heart. It's the reminder of those spiritual blessings that, that buoys us up. It's like a spiritual life preserver. When the pressures of life make us feel like we're sinking, the promises of God buoy us up and keep our head up. It's like our own personal spiritual PFD, our personal flotation device. And in verse 23, it says, Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's like a prayer wish. He says, listen, I want you to remember all the things that God does for you. I want you to embrace these blessings. Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It serves as a reminder of our unity as a part of the body of Christ. It sums up some of the major themes. I mean, six times previous in Ephesians, Paul has talked about peace. Seven times previous, Paul has talked about love and seven more times about faith in this book. And these three blessings figure prominently, but it's more than just a, a, an empty formula. I mean, Paul longs to see all the believers in Ephesus and in the surrounding area, the Jews and the Gentiles alike, living in a way that profoundly reflects who they are in Christ and that helps to promote the mission of Christ. I mean, when he says, peace be unto all the brethren, I mean, he wants us to remember that we should be at peace with each other because we are in the one body of Christ Believers now have peace with God through Jesus Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And because we have that peace with God through Christ, we should live at peace with one another because of Christ and for the sake of Christ. And he wants us to be reminded of the shalom or the, the arene, the, the peace that, that rules and reigns in our midst and that should govern how we relate one to the other. He reminds the believers of love. I mean, can you imagine a place where there was no peace? Can you imagine living in a place where there was no love? But peace can only be accomplished and sustained through mutual love. We have been loved by the Lord who lavished upon us His unimaginable sacrifice and love. So we should love our brothers and sisters in Christ the same way. We love him because he first loved us, and we love others because he loved us. And faith. Love flows out of genuine faith. Love is the evidence, but faith is the root and the foundation. Ephesians 1.15 says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and the love unto all the saints. I mean, he knew that there was real faith, real trust, real belief in Jesus Christ. And out of that converted life, that, that, that transformed life, love flowed freely. Ephesians 3, he prayed for them that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you would continue to be trusting and believing in him, that you being rooted and grounded in love, that, that the reality of the love of the Lord for us would, would be a stabilizing uh, foundation for our lives to go forward. Paul wanted them to continue to be at peace with one another, to grow in their love for other believers, and to allow that love to flow out from their genuine faith in God. And, and folks, there are times in life when we, we might try to point to some, some good thing that's happened. And people could probably point to five hard things that are happening. And, and you know, at some point, you know, it's good to count our blessings about material things, but at some point, the only blessings that will stand up to every test, the only blessings that will stand up to every pressure of life, the only blessings that will stand up to every hardship and adversity in life are the spiritual blessings that flow to us as God's children, as Christians. And that as we dwell together in the body of Christ in a local assembly of believers, 
That we who know peace are to live in peace. We who have received that love are to dispense that love. Those of us who have received the Lord by faith are to live out our lives by faith. And that keeps the church a little bit of heaven on earth. It keeps it a place where we know that no matter how difficult the circumstances swirling all around us, that the blessings of God sustain us and enrich us and keep us focused. But let's look at that last verse, because Paul knew believers always need to be encouraged. He wanted them to be encouraged because God was doing powerful things, even in the midst of his hardship. He wanted them to be encouraged by focusing again on the blessings the Lord had bestowed upon them. But God uses reminders of grace and love to encourage other believers, too. Verse 24 says, Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. I mean, God's grace is a gift. That's what the word means. God gives gifts to us. As believers, we have received the gift of salvation. We have been justified, accepted before the Father because of what Jesus Christ has done to save us. That we now have a righteousness that's not our own. We're accepted in the beloved one. We've been reconciled. All those different blessings of salvation, that is a gift. It is the gift of God, saving grace. But God, God has much more grace to pour out his gifts upon his people. There are also gifts of sustaining grace. I mean, God gives us grace to hold up and to prosper spiritually during suffering so that when we come through that furnace of affliction, we shall come forth as gold. He gives us grace to serve faithfully through demanding circumstances so that we can serve with joy. He gives us grace to speak boldly even in the face of adversity so that we can speak forth the truth as we ought. And that we won't cut corners on who we speak to or what we share with them. We will speak wisely and boldly for the Lord's sake. And he gives us grace to practice sacrificial stewardship of our material blessings. How else in the world could the widow have put in her two mites? A pittance according to earthly standards. But God saw the grace operating in that woman's life. And he said, there is a generosity, there is a worship for the Lord that makes her joyful to invest so sacrificially. And folks, that's God's grace working in our hearts to shape us. Paul knew personally of that grace. When he wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he said, And the Lord said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And God had said, I know you've prayed three times, but my answer is still the same. No. For whatever reason, you don't know, I do. I've left that trial. I've left that hardship. It feels like a messenger of Satan sent to at me to beat me up but for whatever reasons that I have chosen not to tell you I will just tell you that my grace will be sufficient to meet your every need and Paul responded to that truth saying most gladly therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities or my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me but there is in this verse one phrase that I think is important to realize. That is, grace be with all them that love the Lord Jesus Christ, or our Lord Jesus Christ, in sincerity. It's an interesting word. He says, this special blessing be upon all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. It's the same word that's translated if you read 1 Corinthians 15 where it talks about that we shall, because of Christ's resurrection, he is the first fruits of the resurrection and we too shall be raised up in the end time and we shall be raised and given a body that is incorruptible. Same word. Same word here. In fact, the different Bible translations will translate it incorruptible love, love incorruptible, um, an undying love, 
But insincerity is a good translation. Here's the concept. Here's, here's what he's talking about here. Believers' love for the Lord Jesus Christ is to be pure. It's to be uncorrupted with wrong motives or secret disloyalties. We're to have a love for our Savior and the Lord that is sincere, that our love is not watered down by apathy, but it's fueled by a fervent devotion. That uh, there's no conflict because of other pursuits that, that stifle our love. But love is holding controlling force in our life, our love for the Lord. That our love is not maintained with a thin veneer of spirituality, but it runs through every fiber of our being. He's basically saying that, that God has blessings He wants to pour out on all of you who continue to love the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity so that your love is not corrupted, your love is not watered down, your love is not in conflict with other things that you begin to love more. That you have an undying love, a sincere love that remains. And folks, the challenge is that we must always be on guard to be sure that our love does not change in its essential qualities. Do you love the Lord as much now as the day you trusted Jesus Christ? Do you still find yourself in awe of God's grace and overwhelmed with gratitude because of His mercy? Does the reality of the Lord's love still motivate you to make any change needed in your life? Because He is my Lord. He gave His life for me. And my whole life belongs to Him. Does the reality of the Lord's love still motivate you to engage in challenging ministry joyfully because of the opportunities to serve your Master? I mean, it is a constant danger. Peter put it, that you love the brethren fervently. Because he realized we could get unfervent. We could lose the edge. We could lose that, that passion. It's a dangerous thing. Very dangerous thing spiritually. It is a constant danger. In fact, it was to this very church that a warning was issued some 30 years later by the Apostle John. In Revelation chapter 2, as John was writing to the seven churches of Asia Minor, those churches that were scattered throughout the western portion of what's now known as Turkey, modern day. And he wrote to the church at Ephesus, and he said this, Unto the angel or messenger of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou cannot bear with them that are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and found them to be liars. I mean, they, they, they wouldn't tolerate false teachers. You have borne up underneath those pressures. You've had patience. And for not my name's sake, you have labored and have not fainted. I mean, that's all really good stuff, right? There's a lot of good stuff going on there. But then he added that one extra phrase that's really at the core of what he's reminding these Ephesians of 30 years earlier. He said, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because you have left your first love. I mean, you, you've walked away from the kind of love you had at the beginning. I mean, it's, it's not controlling your motives. It's not controlling your actions. You're, you're justifying. You're rationalizing. You yawn instead of lift up your hands and praise. He said, you're still doing all the right things. But you don't have the right fuel. The generator's not working right. The reactor's not producing the right motive and passion. The thing that he's concerned about is you've left your first love. You've moved away from that love you've had from the start when you couldn't think of anything you'd loved more than serving God, when you couldn't think of anything more high priority than to yield your life to obey God. And he reminded them that God has a special blessing that he pours out on all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. 
And folks, we, we are no better than they were, right? We're, we're susceptible to the same kinds of things. I am, you are. It's a battle for the spiritual heart and soul of a believer that the God of this world, if he can't take your salvation away, which he cannot, he would like to take the blessings of salvation away from you. He would like you to forget the purpose for the believer. He'd like to steal away the passion of the believer. He'd like to steal away the unity of the believers. And he works hard. He is wily, cagey. He is deceitful. And he works so that he can get us like a good judo move to trip ourselves up. And folks, just like the apostle warned those believers many, many hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, it is still an eternal spiritual reality that we must continue to love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity and not allow an apathy to creep over and turn our hearts cold. To not allow a disinterest to creep into our souls that causes us to lose interest in the work of God. To not allow a distance to develop between us and God so that it produces a distance between us and other believers. Folks, that warning, that promise of blessing and the warning if we don't heed it, and, and danger if we don't heed that, is just as real and just as much to be heeded in our day as it was 2,000 years ago. And Paul wanted to encourage those believers, to encourage them, so he reminded them of grace and love that the Lord wants to pour out in our hearts. God uses faithful servants to encourage other believers. Paul thought of others instead of himself. He, he knew he could count on Tychicus to deliver a heartwarming, soul-stirring word of encouragement to, to help the church. God uses reminders of our divine blessings to encourage other believers. And God uses reminders of his grace to be poured out upon those who love him to encourage us as believers. What an encouragement it is to be a part of God's family and to be a part of his people. Christians belong to God and he never intended that any of us would live aloof or in isolation, but rather together in community. Christians are like sheep, so we're supposed to flock together. Christians in the church is an army and as soldiers we need to stand together and fight together. We all need spiritual encouragement. And we can all share spiritual encouragement with others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for the way you worked in people's lives long ago. And Lord, we are thankful that you are still the same God. Nothing has changed about you. Nothing has changed of your promises. Nothing has changed about your principles that you've laid out. And so, Lord, we too are a people who need to be encouraged. We need to be reminded of the things that you are doing powerfully, even sometimes when it looks like things are difficult or bleak around us. Lord, we need to reflect upon our blessings so that we don't become worldly-minded, earth-bound, and, and forget that you have blessings that the world can never match, the world can never replace. And Lord, to know that you shower your grace, your good gifts, upon those who continue to love you in sincerity. Father, thank you. Thank you that you even gave your word here to encourage those believers and us. And I pray that you would continue to to refresh our souls and continue to stir up our hearts that we might love you and serve you faithfully for your glory, for the good of your church, and for the well-being of, of those that we would share the gospel of Jesus Christ with. And Lord, I thank you. Lord, thank you for encouraging us to be that one who has taken our place, that one who suffered in place of us, and you've sent your Holy Spirit to, to stand alongside of us, to strengthen us in this 
walk we call the Christian life. And Father, I do thank you and pray that you'd speak to our hearts. Lord, if there's one area of our life where perhaps we have grown apathetic or indifferent or compromising or, or aloof, Father, I pray that you would, you would work upon us, humble our hearts, shape our hearts and encourage us. Lord, help us to remember your blessings and to be a blessing. And Father, we thank you for all that you will do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.